Uh, today, what I want to talk about is, first of all, just a bit of a perspective as we come out of the last couple of years. It's been such a divisive time and it doesn't need to be. Uh, for some reason, the virus became political, in, especially down south, and we, it's silly. So, so just a perspective on that. Talk a little bit about what I'm doing and some common underwriting conditions. You know, here's my perspective on COVID. I, I don't want to go over the last two and a half years, but I, I can tell you that if you hated the lockdowns, hated the isolation, hated the things that happened, like that's totally logical. I couldn't stand not leaving my house. I couldn't stand the isolation. I couldn't stand not seeing my kids. We have grown kids in their 20s and 30s who are all either married to a doctor or are doctors. And so, as my kid said who's in training, I can't be the one who goes back to sick kids and says, sorry about the outbreak, but I cheated and saw my parents this weekend. Right? So my kids were hardcore and I didn't see them for a long, long time. I did not like the shutdowns. But unfortunately, they worked. So if you look at what happened in Canada, Missouri, for example, is one state, lost 0.5% of its population. Canada was closer to 0.1%. In Canada, what we did worked. You may not have liked it. We all we saw people poking fun at the Conservatives, at the Liberals, whatever, right? In Ontario and in Alberta, you've had a Conservative on one side and a Liberal federally. The fact is, between vaccinations, between shutdowns, we had some of the lowest death rates in the developed world. Like, that's an amazing outcome. So you're allowed to hate it, but let's not worry about what happened and de like there's no point right i still wear a mask i'll still wear a mask in january february my wife still wears a mask when she goes out um like masks don't bug me right when my kids said somebody said well what if you're wearing a mask in the car by yourself and my answer is well sometimes i like forget right you get home and go man i still have my mask on because i wear one all the time in some parts of what i do so i think let's Let's just try and get past that and think about what the good stuff we might have learned was. So it's the good stuff we might have learned. Well, do you know what? All of a sudden, your providers say, I'm going to set this up for you two next today. Yesterday, you set it up for me. So, so you know what? Our providers, we advanced in ways that you would have never seen without COVID. Right? Canada Life has up to 20 million on our Simple Protect app. Other companies have equally worked on ways to have tech support, had on ways to have tech solutions so that you can save time in what you're doing. You now, when you've got somebody up in Red Deer on a small term renewal that's not going to pay you even for the hotel room or taking them out to lunch, can probably do some of that stuff on a Zoom call or a Teams call or whatever your platform is. Right? People are now used to it. Your clients are now used to it. You're now used to it. You've, everybody's willing to do this stuff that they weren't used to. Now the problem is we need to balance that with the relationships which are part of your job. You all are relationship experts, that's why you're in what you do. So how do you balance that with like actually, you know, not traveling and traveling and how do you make that work? And you're all gonna have your own solutions for that. If you have a young techie group, they might never wanna see anyway, right? If your demographic is doesn't do computers, yeah, you know everything might be in person. So you're gonna have to figure that out in your own demographic. I really worry about our industry and every industry going forwards. And I, you know, my kids are young in business, in the business, one's in the accountant and one's a resident at a hospital. And they note that the people coming from COVID education are struggling a little bit. They just didn't get the same education, the same learning, that, that osmosis thing that happens when we work together is harder to do. So everybody's gonna have to figure that out. Manufacturers, IDC, like everybody, individual advisors, how do we make that happen? It's a bit of a scary time for that reason, but it's kind of exciting. Like I went from one day, lawyers telling me to do letters for me, there was no way they could do it except by mailing me boxes of paper. Like literally, they would, whatever, UPS me, three or four full legal boxes full of paper to do like a medical legal report. And by like three days later after COVID, it was like, hey, we can only send it to you electronically. It was like, that's how fast change happened. They're now doing witnesses in court by Zoom. Like I've asked for years, I, I mean, I, I once had to fly to New Brunswick from Ontario to be an expert witness. I was on the stand for 15 minutes, cost them about $4,000 between travel and paying me. Like what an utter waste of time, right? So there's, on the other hand, as we just talked about, I'm a runner, I got to run in New Brunswick, so it was okay with me, right? I got to see a new city, but still, what a waste of time. So all of that stuff has advanced more than it ever would have happened without COVID. So again, I hated it. But let's take the good stuff, it happened. 
And at home, what can we do differently? Like now we have more flexibility. And I, I said yesterday, but I, 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 I still think back to Rogers telling me, we'll be there on Thursday, sometime between eight and four, you know, to fix your TV. And then you'd be trying to figure out how to get a day off work or take a vacation day. Like now you can probably blend that into your work schedule. So that's an amazing thing for people who had rigid in-office jobs. You know, everybody got used to doing, doing Teams meetings or Zoom or whatever it was. I mean, there's still somebody who doesn't push the unmute button when it's their turn to speak every single meeting, but we're better at it than we were. And if you remember your Zoom meetings at the beginning, <laughs> what a crap show they were. So, and we're gonna have to get used to this because the fact is, especially the younger demographic, doesn't see why we have to go to the office every day doesn't see why we need to see everybody eye to eye. And so we're going to have to find a way to incorporate some of the new learning into the way we all do business. For me, the message of my life has been, and I, you know, I was thinking about this, is so many people talk about, oh, we got to get back to pre-COVID, as if we had this calm, peaceful, cool life pre-COVID. Like, what I remember from pre-COVID is working 16 hours a day, flying all over the place, my, my phone ringing all the time, as Ronnie said, answering text at all times of the day and night. Like, this is what our life had become. And it started because probably, what, in 19, I, you know what, my friend had a car phone in 1980. So we walked forward from there and then we all got cell phones, right? When my dad, in 19, he retired in about 80, when he l left his bank and the vault locked, he couldn't work at night if he wanted. Then we got cell phones, then we got Wi-Fi, then we worked at home, then we dealt across different time zones. So it's not fair for me for somebody in Alberta if I sign out at five, because that only supports still three, right? So, so all of this stuff started happening and life eroded and eroded our personal time. And then COVID happened and on top of everything else, our job land in our living room. No wonder it stinks right now. So my message to you all is as we get out of this and we get back to what we're gonna call normal in the future, let's find a way to do it right. Like the way we did it before wasn't right, don't kid yourself. We had this erosion into our own personal stuff all the time. So let's find a way going forward, how's it gonna work for you? How are you gonna make sure you still have time to run, go to the gym, eat properly, look after your kids, look after your parents and do your job and get that balanced and we can start now because it's really hard to do it over the years when there's been this constant erosion. We have a reset point, which is actually a really cool thing, and we may never have again. So I would just encourage you all as we get out of COVID, like, right, you can not like what happened. You can blame Justin or you can blame Doug in Ontario, whoever you blame, but it doesn't matter. It happened, we survived better than most countries, and now we gotta figure out a way. So why do you build your own life better? There's a way coming out of this that's a way better solution than you had going in, and you'll never get a chance for a reset like this. So that's sort of my only COVID message. Um, I want to talk a little bit about claims because I think this should basically be our only marketing material and we'd sell more product than we sell, sell otherwise. Right? I don't think if you told anybody in your, well, most of your clients would not believe that we pay 80% of our DI claims. And now where these numbers are, I'm assuming that all our partners in the industry, our, our competitors, do similar things to this. This is individual insurance at Canada Life from 1918. Um, I would have done 1919, but COVID. And then I'm now not in the business anymore. So the 1918, but I did talk to them and find out it hasn't changed dramatically. And what I find out is we pay 80% of our DI claims. Now, we, we should, as I was asked to mention, we should mention that that just happens to coincide to our 80 years in the business for DI. And for obvious reasons, I've been asked, is Canada Life looking at getting out of the DI business? And the answer I've been asked to give is, like, absolutely not. Like, so we're still committed to the business. Um, and more importantly, our industry pays claims, right? And why don't we pay DI claims? Why is it the 20% that we don't pay? Some of them, like, DI is a business where like there's times you think you're disabled and we think you're not. Like that's the nature of DI. It is never gonna be perfect, right? We're never gonna get to the point where everybody says, yeah, you're right, I'm not disabled. Like that's not disability. <laughs> but lots of these 20%, that's not 20%. A large part of the 20% are people bought the wrong product. Doctors, like my kids, who buy only the group product from the medical association because they're not convinced an individually underwritten product is any better. Right? Lots of docs are like that. Lots of people who only want to pay two years of ONOC are pretty frustrated when their claims are cut off after two years. 
But guess what? You made a decision to only buy two years of only hawk. Nobody likes it that your claim's cut off, but it's a decision you made. And now you have to live with the consequence of that. Just like if you die and you should have bought two million of coverage and you only bought one million, your wife can't call the company and say, you know, we needed two. Could you? Right? It's not the way it works. You made a decision on what to buy. That's a lot of the reason behind DI. On CI, we also pay 80%. Big reason we don't pay them on CI is that everybody who asks me about a possible CI condition, the answer is submit a claim and let us find out. You have a mole on your back, Ronnie. I, I don't think it was cancer, Bruce, but you know the doctor said, said I should get it checked. Could that be a CI claim? Submit it and find out. Right? That's how we do our business. And I think every company's like that. We want to see the claims because we don't want to leave any unpaid. And so, but that means you're gonna have some that don't count, right? We don't try and pre-underwrite the claims when they come in. So you're gonna have a few. There are a few that happen, and you should know this with CI if you're selling it. When you're selling CI, some people sell it as, it pays a claim if you have a critical illness. It doesn't. It pays a claim if you have a critical illness that's on our list of critical illnesses, and it fits the definition. And almost, like, like the lists are pretty good, right? But we sell a lot of product, and I, inevitably hear about the odd one where, you know, Manu or Sun paid and we didn't or vice versa because somebody had an old contract and somebody had a new contract and the wording isn't the same. And that's terribly complicated for your clients and it's not very nice, right? It's a definition driven product and I've seen it happen in both ways and it's rare, 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 but not never. Okay, so, but the main reason things aren't paid in CI is because we tell everybody to try. For life, that's silly. We had about 30,000 death claims paid in that year, and we didn't pay exactly 30. That's 0.1%, right? Nobody would have guessed the number's that good. And one of them I remember was somebody who was a medical professional who, on the way home from their chemotherapy, you know, bought insurance with a clean app. Right, you, we shouldn't pay that claim. Now, it's never, I would say, I'm happy not to pay that claim, but I'm not, because you still have a grieving widow who thought they were covered in that case. So it still stinks, right? So what I want to hit at just on that point is 99.9% .9 is a great number. A lot of the responsibility now falls to you to keep that number at 99.9%. .9 so what's happened in the past, what, 10 years even, 15 years, but it's been accelerated in the past two years, is the changes in non-med limits, right? And so right now, with only getting, say, non-med, like your questions, up to, say, a couple million dollars, and I'm now sort of taking an average number across the industry, but whatever it is, your questions really matter, don't they? It's the one chance we have to get history to underwrite. So, for example, today, if it's a $2 million case, and let's assume, and I don't know all everybody's agent amounts, let's assume the only thing is an app, and your client forgets they're on insulin for diabetes. And then they apply, we issue, and you're all happy because it was issued in eight hours, but they die in a car accident in six months. That's an unpaid claim, right? You gotta take the time to answer the questions. Field underwriting is more important than it ever was before because five years ago for $2 million, we didn't just have the chance of the app, we had three other chances to find out the truth. Paramed's, doctor's reports, blood tests. Now it's one shot. Companies aren't looking for reasons not to pay the claim. And it's not a trick question. Do you have diabetes? It's not a trick question. We're not trying to fool people. We're not trying to do anything else. But you all got mad at us. And in fact, we got criticized in court for asking the same question two or three times. So now we're asking the question once, and the answer matters. But I think sometimes advisors, because, because the whole way we talk is that it's easier and faster, is sometimes advisors forget that the field underwriting now becomes an even more important piece of the puzzle. So companies are working hard to keep 99.9 .9 at 99.9. .9. What are they doing? We hired somebody to make sure, it's called a behavioral economist, I think. Never heard of it. A guy with a PhD from Australia we flew over and helped us write our questions to make it most likely that you'd give truthful answers. Right? And you can imagine how you ask a question matters. Right? So we tried to find ways to ask them in the simplest language in the most straightforward ways, without any judgment, that get your right answer. Ronnie, you don't drink much, do you? Versus Ronnie, how much do you drink? Two, 10, 15, how many a day? Right? 
20? Sorry, I didn't go high enough. Um, um, medical confidentiality. Yes, medical confidentiality is all gone. Um, so no, I, I think it's, it's really important how we ask questions, and so we've done that. Companies are talking about using data, right? And we're all trying to use data. Data is such a new thing. It reminds me of you know, the computers that built Apollo versus the computers we have now, that story. Like, data's gonna grow. In the future, data will be everything to us. And data is now starting to mean something. Companies are doing all sorts of things. We do uh, random tests or doctor's reports. It's a pretty big percentage of cases when we do them. Why? Because 99.9 .9 needs to stay at 99.9 .9, and every one of your manufacturers wants that to happen. Right? Our business survives because we pay claims. Manufacturers are in the business of paying claims. You're in the business of selling product. We're in the business of paying claims. So everybody's working hard to keep it at 99.9, .9, and I don't want to leave anybody afraid by saying field underwriting matters, because 30 out of 33, sorry, 30 out of 30,000 claims is a darn good number, and we want to keep it that way. So I think I just think that if our public, if the public knew this, that would sort of be all we had to say. The big topics I want to cover, because these are the ones we get all the time. Um, one of the things that I, that's happened during COVID when I talk to various manufacturers actually is because people aren't getting out and seeing their clients, maybe clients are reluctant to see you, it's more complicated, whatever it is. What I'm seeing, what we're seeing is that sometimes policies aren't getting delivered in as timely a fashion. Remember that if something happens to the client, the company may not allow that that policy is valid, right? You got to deliver the policy to the client. And I'm hearing stories about people having policies for months without giving them to a client. I mean, I don't mean you got to drive Friday at nine o'clock, right? But we're seeing delays longer than usual, right? And so I just need to remind you when we issue a policy, it's important to get it to the client. Um, I think uh, um, there, there was this malicious thing that went around the internet. I, I had no idea where it came from, but it was a video with a guy who looked like a doctor in a white coat and a stethoscope saying he'd been involved in cases that insurance companies hadn't paid a COVID death claim when people died of the COVID vaccine because it was an experiment and you were responsible. So first of all, utter hogwash, it was an experiment. It was a great product. It saves thousands and millions of lives around the world. It wasn't an experiment. It's just ridiculous nonsense that somebody made up. And the fact is, yes, companies pay claims if you were to die of the COVID vaccine. Remembering if that happened in Canada, it certainly hasn't happened very many times. But if it did, we'd pay the claim. Now, paying COVID claims is another malicious note that went around the internet is because COVID was concocted in a lab somewhere. It's not a real virus and people wouldn't die. We're not paying, like this is the kind of garbage that was going around to the point where the CLHA actually has stuff on their website saying, yes, we pay COVID death claims of which Canada Life has paid many and we would pay a COVID of a COVID vaccine claim of which I don't think we've had any. So of course we'd pay those claims. It's outrageous, I have to mention it. But you know, when social media goes around, it gets hard to know the truth. And when the guy's got like a white coat, everybody assumes he's actually a doctor, right? So um, the, other, the other kind of good topics, the genetics update, and one of the other manufacturers said to me this morning, God, this genetic stuff gives me ulcers because it's just, there's more and more stuff that's genetics. And just, just so you're aware, in Canada, there was a law passed a few years ago that said insurance companies can't use genetic information. I personally think it was the wrong, the wrong move. What it says is that we can underwrite everybody except people who've had a genetic test. So, so everybody else is paying because people who've had a genetic test might have a higher risk they don't have to tell us about. Right now, the reason it was felt to be necessary is because people weren't getting genetic tests because they were afraid of the insurance implications. Right, so I understand why they thought they had to do it. I don't think it was the right move regardless. However, it's still the law in Canada. It may have an impact on insurance companies in the future because more and more tests are genetic testing. Right, more and more diseases are discovered, sorry, by genetic testing. More and more stuff is found to be genetic. We, all sorts of the congenital cardiac diseases that were just because when I was in medical school are now due to a defect on a certain chromosome in a certain place. Right, so more and more of this stuff we now know which we never had a clue before. So how does that impact insurance? I don't know, <laughs> nice time to be not underwriting anymore because it's gonna have an impact in the future in some way. But the main thing is most companies, or at least our company in Canada, will use a, posi a, a, a favorable genetic test. And let me, let me just give you the example. 
Um, you have a family history of Huntington's Korea, which is the one where everybody dies in their 50s, right, if you have it. You have a 50% chance of getting it if you have a family history. We're going to give coverage, but it's going to have a $10 per thousand rating. That's expensive, right? If you go have a genetic test that says you have a 100% chance of dying in your 50s, so you have the gene, we have to sell you insurance at the same price as if you just have the family history. So the good news for your client is, even if they tell us, because this is complicated, people tell us all the time, we just ignore it. So if they tell us they have the gene for Huntington's, we'll still issue it as if we didn't know that. The only time we'll use a test is if they say, I had a test that proves I don't have Huntington's Korea. Right, I, I had the genetic test and I don't have it. And if that's the case, then as long as we have proper consent, which we wrote, but we have a consent, then we can issue standard coverage. That makes sense? So we'll use favorable. We're not allowed to use unfavorable. You can hear that's a bit unbalanced, right? And for a few years, till it works itself out, probably not a big deal. I hope it works itself out, because it doesn't make much sense to me right now. Um, so sorry, back. shoot, yeah. Yeah, the question was the genetic information trumps the family history question if it's favorable. And if it, if it I mean, it's vi like the, we could do an hour on genetics and I, I promise not to, it's a real rabbit hole for me because I love this stuff. Um, breast cancer, for example, is one where people say I have a terrible family history but I don't have the gene. The problem is doctors only test for three genes and there's about a thousand. So in that case, the genetic test may not trump the family history and Huntington's Korea does. So it all depends on the test. And um, we have to understand that. Um, dope, it, you know, dope's hard, right? Because on a medical point of view, very little proof about what it does. A little bit of a benefit for some anxiety, worse for most anxiety. Like people who take it for anxiety disorders usually get worse. Um, it may work, you know, you all know there's a few things, chronic pain, the, you've read about a few epilepsies and stuff. CBD's never had a study that showed it does anything, yet it's being marketed to cure everything. And I have a bunch of friends and relatives who take CBD and swear they've cut out completely lots of other drug use. So pot to me on the medical side is exciting because we're now seeing studies actually happen. Is it going to work? Is dope, I, I want to find out so that in five years I can say, stop it, you're using dope for fun. Or good, you're using it for something that works. But right now we just don't know and so people, it's, the risk isn't that high so people are trying. You know what, if you've got to take Tylenol 3s and you think that I don't know, eating a half a gummy at night lets you sleep instead of Tylenol 3s. Have at it, right? No judgment involved. Now, what do insurance companies do? Non-smoker, unless you're mixing it with tobacco, right? Marketing decision, not a risk decision. Let's not kid ourselves, it's not because of risk, it's a marketing decision, and that's okay, the risk is pretty minimal. Then how much can you use and still get insurance? I think every, this is be broad for every company, I suspect. If you use a tiny little bit, you're standard. What is a tiny little bit different for every company? Right? Did you eat a quarter gummy every night before you went to bed? Because it helped you sleep. Drop under your tongue if you use the oil. Did you, you know, I know how to roll way too well. But on, it was a long, <laughs> it was university. And one night the bong broke and we had to learn, you know. Um, so, I mean, seriously, right? We tried it. But, but the thing is now, as long as you're not mixing it with stuff, as long as you're using, some people tell me they have like one toe can put the joint out at night to get to sleep. Like, I don't know if anybody actually does that, but that's the story sometimes. Those people can even be standard. The person who's stoned all the time is a decline. The person who's getting high every day. People say, well, let me have a drink a day, not a joint a day. Well, the problem is, one drink a day doesn't get you wrecked. And with the strength of pot these days, one joint's a lot of dope. Right? So, like, right? Because it's like 10 times the strength that it was when I was a kid. And it used to be that this guy I knew and another guy I knew would split a joint and be pretty stoned. Right? I used to drive them around. As the, <laughs> um, I was the designated driver. Uh, uh, you know, like it's just different. And so it's not the same to have one joint a day as a glass of wine. So we're looking at are people wrecked or are they, you know, just, just a bit because they think it helps. And if it does or not, no judgment, it might. If you're using it good, we just don't know yet. 
And then somewhere in the middle, talk to your providers. Say to them, like, what is it that you need to know? How can I get the best rating for this client? What are you going to do with dope use? Because how do we know how much they're using? Different strengths. You know, you go to the pot store now, it's like a whole, like, you can buy different strengths. And they say, this one will make you happy. This one will make you tired. By the way, no evidence. But that, anyway, that's, that's the, the sort of, you look in your newspaper, who's doing the pot education, how it can help you presentations, right? Nobody trusts Big Pharma to do them, but everybody trusts their local pot store to teach us how to use pot. Come on. Right? We don't know yet. But use a little bit of it. You think it's helping. Probably OK. Who are, like, come on. We're trying to make a way to do business here. And then in between, how do I know what strength to use? How long you hold your breath? You know, how deep to, like, they're all different. So work with your provider to, to, to get the best solution for your clients. The last couple of things up there just are great stories. Um, I, our company and, and at least some other companies on the transgender side treat, pe treat people as the gender they choose to be. Right? So I don't care your chromosomes. If you tell us you identify as a woman, you're a woman. If you tell us you identify as a man, you're a man. People will say to me, just, just one sec, because people will say to me, what if I just say I'm a woman so I can get cheaper life insurance? <laughs> so first of all, I so want to see that happen. It would just be... <laughs> It would be a story I'd tell for the rest of my life, because it would be great. But remember, transgender people, first of all, first of all, just remember that the society we live in. 30 years ago, Elton John would have lost his career just for being gay, he pretended he was straight. Right? Think about how we have changed the world in the past 30 years, to the point where people can actually admit they're trans now. Like, good on us. Like, good on us for being accepting of people and how they feel. Do I fully understand what it means to be trans? No. When I hear people arguing with people about, you hear conservative people, I'm going to come on my Facebook feed arguing with people, I'm going like, don't care. Like, it's your life. Why do I care how you identify? Right? On a personal level. My daughter's gay, is pregnant, got married last year in front of her 99-year-old grandmother. Would not have happened 30 years ago. Right? Great way we've progressed in our society. So on the society side, great news. On our side, it's like, come on, you're taking the hormones, you're probably changing the risk. Trans people are overrepresented. Suicide. Um, depression, street living, um, like you name it, they're overrepresented in bad stuff. But it's probably from living with the rest of us, not from being trans. So we underwrite that out, just to be clear, right? If you're a suicidal trans person, you're declined just like a suicidal non-trans person. But once we underwrite that out, we take you out your gender you identify as. Remember, we get a doctor's report. We know you're not making it up. We're really underwriting these cases carefully. But then we take you with the gender you identify as. Did that answer what you're going to ask? Yeah, because my, my question was, well, someone just says, well, I want to identify as a man, so my disability is Of course. Closer. So there's got to be much more criteria. Yes. Nobody, nobody who identifies, who, nobody who's trans doesn't have a medical file to support what they're doing. Right? And we used to say, well, once the surgeries are all done, because it kind of used to be a thing. Remember, we're learning as we think about this stuff. But years ago, we thought about is you know, you'd start and you'd finish when you had top surgery, bottom surgery, the whole bit. Now many people don't do some of those surgeries. As long as you don't have a big surgery in the next month or two, you know, as long as, you know, that kind of thing, just like any other major surgery. So that's how we look at trans people. And again, I think, I think that'd be a great positive story to your clients in most cases. Certainly, I wish the press would stop one or negative stuff, right? That's a, it doesn't usually come out as a positive story anyway. And medical assistance and dying, again, I, I want to be very clear. If you have a strict religious or personal for some reason position that you never think medical assistance and dying should happen, I love that in Canada we can have that position in this room and we can just chat about it. Right? We don't have to hate each other for having a different opinion about this. So that's awesome. It's an awesome thing about Canada that even some of our closest neighbors have lost lately. Right? So you, you are welcome to have that opinion. Personally, I believe MAID is a really important tool that some people can use that can be an amazing thing for people. My mother-in-law died of terrible cancer pain. And after three or four days in a coma, she was on a Sunday. We had to go back. My wife's a teacher. She had to set up a classroom. Didn't know whether to go, whether to not go. Right? We had this discussion. We'll go set up the classroom and drive right back. You know, the whole thing. I want to be with my mother when she dies, but I really need, you know, you know. If you've lost a relative, you know. Her mother didn't want to die alone. If her mother would have had the choice to die with her whole family around her, she would have chosen that. Instead, she died alone in the room the next day. Right? Not a good situation. Would she have taken 
uh, medical assistance dying? Like, what do I know? But, but it would have been nice if it was an option for her. Not for us, for her. I've heard from several advisors in the past couple of years, neurological conditions actually, where a parent has like ALS, dying of ALS, down to the point where they, they're going to die because it's such a, it's a terrible disease, right? Where they've gone and had like a, a wake party with their parent. That night the parent has doctor assisted dying and the next day they have a wake wake. So this person has chosen to have their whole family around them and have a party and then die and then have the family be able to gather and remember them the next day. When people tell me this, they're bawling their eyes out. It was the best way they can think of for it to happen. You don't want to do it for your relative? Don't. But for them, it was the most respectful, wonderful way they'd said goodbye to their, their parents. So on a clinical side, I really want you, whatever you believe, to work in your community to get the answer you want. Work with your politicians, your minister, your rabbi, your priest, like whatever it is. Whoever it is that you network with, because we need to work on a grassroots level. If you read the press in Canada, we're starting to slip down the slope. That slippery slope of it becoming too easy to get medical assistance and dying. I, I have to say, I don't really have a comment because I don't know the cases. I mean, the press reports these cases. How do I know what the actual facts are, right? So I know that they're now talking about we're down the slippery slope a bit. All that matters to me is we get to the right place in Canada. I don't want to be at the point when I'm 80 that my kids go, Dad's, Dad's term insurance expires in six months. <laughs> Maybe we should have a visit to the doctor with him. All right, I, that, it sounds goofy, but people will abuse their family for money, obviously. We know that, right? So when you talk to families, make sure they're clear, talk to their children about what they want at the end of the life. Make sure that they've thought this through and talked about it. You engage on ground level. Really one of the most important things you could do because all of us are getting older and want the right thing available, not the wrong thing. Or nothing if that's what you, again, whatever you want. The main thing is insurance companies pay deaths from medical assistance and dying. Not considered suicide. Don't care if it's three months, six months, two years, ten years after the policy is issued. We have paid many of these claims. Okay, so just to be very clear. February you apply for life insurance, you feel perfect. April you get belly pain. June you have pancreatic cancer. July you're dying. Five months after issue. Terrible pain. You decide you want to do the wake and then awake the next day thing. Whatever you want to do, you want to party, right? You want to do that, it's five months after issue. Every insurance company in Canada is paying that claim. No question, five months, okay? Um, here's the proviso. If your belly pain jar had started in January and you applied for insurance in February, different story, right? So it doesn't get you away from validity because you didn't tell us the truth. But medical assistance and dying will not interfere with the claim. That's another thing that was such a big question. CLHA has put it on their website. And I think every man, I'm trying to look around at manufacturers, but the sun, uh, every manufacturer, I think, has also has on their website a statement about medical assistance and dying. But certainly CLHA does. So again, great story from my industry. And I don't think people in general believe that we do this stuff. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about large cases, just because it's what I do. Um, so, so I really believe that in the large case market, and we just talked about how it's gone, like we've commoditized millions of dollars of coverage, right? You have millions of dollars of term coverage for nothing and you get it by like signing on. And my kids now think a couple million of coverage is nothing because that's what their friggin' house costs. You should see the house my daughter bought in Toronto. It's 1,200 square feet on three floors for a million dollars. A walk-up condo and guess who she has to carry the couches up? <laughs> the good news is his father was a way better swearer than I was. I can do okay, but he was awesome. Um, so, so imagine, they don't think a million or two is much money. They don't want to hustle, they don't want to talk to you. They want to just find a way at the bank to fill it a form and get it, right? They don't, they don't care. We've commoditized so much that where we're going to add advice is on the bigger cases, right? And, or the complex cases, or the business cases, or places you've added other value, right? So I believe that your clients that really are used to, anybody who can afford to give us 100 grand in premium, Right? Anybody who can do that really is used to being treated differently than we often treat people. For example, my, my example is just like I have a Toyota and a Subaru. When I go in, they might give me a chit for a free coffee in the Keurig. Actually, it's Subaru, it's a Keurig and I can get a free coffee. Sadly, it makes my day. Um, but you know what, if I had a Mercedes, they'd like pick my car up and be way nicer to me 
and I'm used to that level of service. Now, if I, if I can afford to give $100,000, that's the level of service I think I'm used to most of the time. So I'm trying to help give that level of service. And how do we do it? Basically, at our company, and I, I would say each of our competitors could give a similar story about what they're trying to do on large cases, so I'm not suggesting we're unique. I can only tell you what I do. I dive in on cases at any point from your first interview with the client up until the decision comes out, right? So don't matter along the way. We don't have a process about how to activate me. All you do is you talk and I'll have a list of the Canada Life resources at the end. But you, you email me, you call me, you, like I don't care, you talk to our Canada Life Marketing Center person and ask them, because you forgot how to spell my last name, what my email is, like I don't care, just, just message me, we'll figure it out. And I've been involved in all sorts of things. I mean, one of my favorite ones actually was my very first one. And it was a case where two business owners had like run their business for, I don't know, 10 years. And they'd never really realized how big it was. I don't know if they didn't talk to their account, but they never knew. And so somehow their record keeping, succession, everything process was around, there's a checkbook in a drawer and whoever was in wrote the checks. Like this was their like whole process amongst the owners. And, and one of them died suddenly. And now it's a crap show, right? They got families, some of the kids are in the business, some aren't. You, you know the mess in a personal business like this. So one of our advisors spent over a year working with them to set up proper corporate structure and all this stuff that you all understand better than I would. And after that time passed, they said the surviving wife needed like 50 million in coverage. She had the best children I've ever heard who said, we're not letting mom apply for insurance. We don't care if we lose all our money. Mom lost her husband. She has diabetes. You're going to decline her and we don't want her to put her through that again. We don't care about the money. We're not doing that to mom. <laughs> my kids would not say that. <laughs> Just telling you. Uh, no, my kids, my, I don't know if they would. I should ask them. Um, so, so they're pretty good kids. So what the advisor did is set them up on a Zoom call with me and we talked about the medical history. They had a list of their drugs. We talked about their medical history. I said to the client, probably 150%. I sent the advisor a note saying 80%, 150%, small chance of standard. We happened to get the doctor's report faster. Within two weeks, issued a case for 50 million. Standard. Now here's a case that almost didn't even get applied for, but we were able to help the clients out early. So that's as early as it can be, really. Up into the point we're in the middle of the case. You know, what happens when there's missing evidence? I talked to a developer in Toronto in front of their Lamborghini on their phone on a Zoom call. It was funny because he had, there was a test that he had to have done that he hadn't told his wife about. And his wife was in the car talking and she was getting madder and madder in the front of this car at him for being such an idiot and neglecting his health. And it, anyway, it was a more fun Zoom call on my end than it was on his end, I know that. In the end, not only did we help him because he got the test, it was okay, they got the insurance, but even in the short term, we were able to offer joint last, right? And they weren't mad at their advisor. You know the big problem is, not we can't issue everybody, it's when they think we're idiots and you guys are screwed up. That's when they get mad, right? This fellow was totally fine with hearing you couldn't get coverage because he knew darn well he should have the test done, right? And so we were able to at least solve that communication hurdle. And so that's the kind of stuff I, like, so, so essentially what I've done, and some people I've worked with a lot, like Ronnie would say to me, like that's no different than what you did to me before when you're the medical director, you would have done that with me. And I would have. So it's not that different for me. The main thing is I don't have to deal with all the head office stuff that was the other half of my job. So for me now, I'm only working for advisors, plus I'm actually paid by Canada Life Advisory Network. So when I work with you, it doesn't cost anything, but also um, I, like it's a bit different, right? I'm on the other side of the coin. I'm, I'm one of them instead of one of the inside. So I can help you convince the underwriter a little bit. So um, just a couple of case studies and, and then any questions you want, totally up to you. The first case study was a couple out west, rich people needed $75 million of coverage and they had a stress test. Doctor thought the woman was abnormal. I thought it was normal, but I thought the man was abnormal. Of course the advisor is frustrated because he now thinks we're both dumb because we Neither of us can read a stress test, apparently, because we think different ones are abnormal. And everybody's in an uproar. In the end, um, what I did in this case was called the cardiologist who did the test at the private clinic. They haven't have access to the next level test. Turned out, actually, the man had critical heart disease, needed surgery, and had it within the week of that phone call. 
The spouse was normal. We paced a joint last with her standard, him decline. And what's the referral that this advisor is getting now? I applied for insurance with Ronnie and it saved his life. They really view that insurance application as what saved the husband's life. Can't get a much better referral than that. And so <coughs> not everyone works out like this. I wish it did. But it's fun to get involved and help people make a better space in their life. You know, here's another one where it has nothing to do with the price. This was a ginormous case that came in and it was really all about the male had a stress test with a bit of a problem that he didn't feel like getting followed up. He thought it was a pain in the neck. He went to an executive clinic. He thought they just wanted to do more tests. You know, you've heard that complaint, that criticism about executive clinics. I have no idea what that executive clinic did, but that's what he thought. He really just totally ignored it. We were able to talk to him, understand why it was needed. And again, they placed the joint last. This one was a live case not long ago. I have no idea what happened to the stress test in the end, whether it was normal. But if it's normal, we'll review him, put him on the policy. But at first, he just was not going to because he wanted to be on the policy. And so it's just a matter of helping them understand what the concerns might be and sort of getting them to move on and help you in your case. You know, here's a case that was $20 million. They needed a CT scan on a lesion. The doctor had quite rightly told them, listen, this spot's probably nothing. We'll just do another one in a year to make sure. Right, that's fantastic when you're the clinical doctor and you get to check in a year. When you're an insurance company and you're betting on the next 30 years, it ain't so good, right? We need the next one. So sometimes on this case, on this case it was coming up, we just basically helped in the communication. We could probably get, help get this test done on a big enough case. Like on a, if there's like a million dollars of par premium on the case, I'll find a way to get the test. So love getting, you can imagine, these are like challenging, fun cases for me. This is like a, a new birth in my career. This is a guy doing this stuff. And, um, and again, it's, it's fun to make a difference for people. Main thing I want to say is that so much of what we do, I'm talking about what I did to call people, that this is not a Dr. Bruce thing. One of the things when I started at Can Life, I, I used to hear who owns the decision in the underwriting shop, who owns, who owns. Nobody owns the case. Who owns the case is the advisor and the client, right? What we have to remember always is it's the best thing for you. And so for me, we have Sylvie and a large case team. We have, we have an accountant we can call when your accountant support needs to, you know, if you're trying to help sell us on some complicated accounting policy. We have um, some advisor type people in our group. We have all kinds of people who can help. This is just trying to bring for large cases, bring the whole team to bear to get more than our share of large cases, really what this is about, right? Like everybody's trying to do that. I mean, I, I don't, I'm never comfortable here talking about our company doing better than anything else. Today. You're looking at Manu coming up soon and you could probably talk about stuff you do better than us, right? And that's, I mean, come on, we, we can all talk about the things we do well. Every company's trying to do this stuff and all of our need is to try and get more than our share of the business in, in the market. And so this is what I'm trying to do in this market. And again, send me a note. I just love to get involved in this stuff. Most people who apply for insurance get insurance. If you've had a heart attack, 85% of people get coverage. If you've had cancer and it was more than a couple of years ago, most people get coverage. Some people sooner than that. If you have sleep apnea and you use your sleep machine, you get standard coverage, exclusion on the DI side. Inclu but that includes CI, as long as you've been using it for six to 12 months. If you have depression, if you're the person who during COVID said, man, this sucks being locked in my house. I'm gonna go to my doctor and get in some meds because I'm feeling a bit crappier. You're still standard for life in CI now. Like we're not declining those cases. No, the person who was suicidal because how they felt during COVID is a different story, obviously, and you understand that. So we're all trying to take a look at these conditions and give coverage. Asthmatics on daily medicines. As long as you're not getting a lot of symptoms, probably standard. Asthmatic smokers, not standard. Right? The only person who gets angry about that is the asthmatic smoker who swears they're the ones that smoking won't hurt. Right? But a bad condition, obviously. So most people are getting insurance, so I encourage you to make use of your providers, um, underwriting inquiries, like well, however it is, you find out information, whether it's internal, whether it's external, and I never want to interfere in process. Folks, thank you very, first of all, thanks for the Canada Life business, thanks for your time this morning. I, it's, I wish we were playing golf later today and I wasn't flying out, but thank you very much everybody, have a great rest of your day.